Okay, so I am Harun. I work for Algolia. Uh, as Alex said earlier, we are a search API, and I am personally responsible uh, right now for making our API client. And I noticed while making it, uh, because we're currently making a completely new version, that you are probably making an API client, and that most of the cases, I've probably made like five really small API clients in in uh, in just some projects and because I noticed that um, I notice now as well that my slides are wrong one second <laughs> uh, not not merit that is better so um while you are working on um, on making a project, you're probably using one and you're probably making one. Notice that we're currently, we're basically in an API economy. Any project that you're making is gonna use some APIs like the GitHub API, the movie database, Netlify, Algolia, Facebook, Firebase, Twitter, RATP has APIs, there's a bunch of open ones, dark sky for weather, and probably your own website or your own project also has an API here and there, one for your dashboard, one for your status, this and that. Especially your own API will be important here because that's what we will be talking about. We can organize these in three main categories. The first one is the ones that have an official API client, like Facebook and Twitter and Algolia. They have like this own API client and you import it. Then you have a bunch which mostly have unofficial API clients, at least for JavaScript. Um, while GitHub does have official API clients, they're only for Ruby. Uh, and then the rest of them, they're pretty much just the REST API. They, they, they are just a URL and you can request stuff from it. And for most of the cases, pretty much for every time you can, you should just use the official API client if it exists. I see already a few of you thinking, yeah, but I uh, really need to support Node as well and not just the browser, so I can't use the official API client. Or the official API client it doesn't support one of the endpoints that I really need in my app, so I can't use it. Or my environment is like super crazy and it does not do XHR at all and it's maybe like Google Apps Script or something weird, so I cannot use it. And the last reason is, yeah, but there is none. I cannot use the official API client if there is none. So what are your options then? The first one for the other options is you might want to fork it and just try to fix it if it's uh, open source. But a lot of the times also it is not. So your only option is to make a new repository. You think right now probably like phew, an API client is probably like lots of work and I don't want to do it. I just want to fetch. And you know, for most of the cases, your minimum viable product, if you just need it once, you can just fetch it. But once you start using it more than once, and once you need to request multiple different things, this is more like your minimum viable product. You need to take care that the content type is correct, you maybe have like an API key and a weird header, or your body definitely needs to be JSON and stringified, uh, and then you have the annoying line on the bottom because you're using fetch. So you're thinking, yeah, sure, I need to copy this everywhere and it's fine. I mean, it's just 10 lines of code, Gzip will care, take care of it and it will all just be one thing in the end. But you're kind of getting annoyed by doing this because it is annoying. Um, so you think, let's just put them in a file and export them all. And then we have like maybe one for every method that we have and so you might have done that at some point and then you say well this is an api client you think you're doing nothing but that is an api client you all just get the certification you are now official api client developer um, so because of that point of view when you realize that an api client is just that just a wrapper over existing fetch and xhr um, you can take the lessons in account 
that people have learned while making API clients. So I've learned a few while making this API client, so I'm just gonna share. Of course, if anybody has other ideas, you can also apply them. Most of them are open source. So a first idea that you have is that you may want to have some advantage over fetch. And the difference between this one and the previous one is kind of um, uh, subtle. But the difference here is that the arguments of this method, they actually have the, uh, that are the arguments that you actually will pass to the method and not just body, right? Because when you're using an API client you, or when you're consuming an API, you don't want to really know that it's doing HTTP request. You just want to know what this API does. For the same, for the same amount of money, you just want to have like, I don't know, something that does a local function. You want to make it look as much as a, f as a normal function as possible because that's what we expect. The next thing um, that you really want to do is make sure that you don't have the API clients in a string there because it's not only a uh, problem for security because you might want to like lose this and even if you put them in, uh, in process variables and environment variables if you're gonna pollute your whole app with environment variables it will break at some point and it's it's not ideal so you want to keep that as little as possible and you preferably want to just write it once so how can we deal with the API keys so the simplest way is to say okay every of these methods now has the argument of API key uh, and then it works, but it's kind of more clunky than before because now we need to pass it everywhere and actually you still have the same problem because now it's not at every site where you um, define the method, now it's at every call site. It might actually be worse. So how do we deal with this? So the first thing is to create an, an actual something which you call an API client. and. Uh, all what it will do is make sure that the API key um, is only needed to be called once uh, or written in your app once. So what we will do is imagine we had all our methods of earlier and they're all exported and now they're in an array. You just have some easy way to make them in an array, maybe object.entries, something like that. And we will take all of the methods, we will map over them, and then for each of these methods, we will return something. And what we return is a new function. This new function takes any arguments that you want, applies them to the method, and also adds the API key as its last argument. Um, and then when you want to use it, you just initialize the client, and then the client is an object, um, or an array at least, whatever you want, with each of the um, methods on there and then you can call them simply with the body. So that's already an advantage because now the API key is only in one place. The next, step that you, the next thing that you want to do is you want to use named uh, arguments and the same number of arguments in this thing. So you might be tempted if there's only one argument or uh, right now to just say this is the argument, like query, your search might only do query for example, but at some point this will break for every single API because people will add new arguments. People will say, oh, now you cannot only use a query, you can also use uh, filters or something like that. And that's why it's always useful to use named arguments. Uh, a named argument in this case is to have the same amount of arguments on each of your API methods and both of them, uh, in, at least in, in this strategy, there's only two arguments. The first one is the arguments that you will actually want to call on your methods. And the second one is the ones that you want to be augmented by. So the ones that need to be augmented here are API key. So you separate these to make it really simple to do this uh, augmentation. The next thing you want to do is you want to use the same 
names as your API, the same uh, terminology as much as possible. So what we see here is that our API um, method is called search, but our method here is called get. And we want to avoid that, so you better call it search. You can call it the same name as the method as much as possible, especially for the people who um, are familiar with the API, what the methods are, as well as uh, maybe the API is automatically documented and then your API client has no surprises at all. Uh, what this affords you is to fill in the gaps in your API. Imagine you have a API uh, method, uh, sorry, an API path, right, which does a batch. It's kind of a catch-all request. Um, all it does is you, you accept some array and the array is actions. And for example, this action can be add objects, remove object, delete object, things like that. Um, and if you want to just translate the API into an API client, you would just have the method batch. But if you're making an API client, you are afforded the possibility to make to split this up into multiple methods. You can use a method, uh, make a method called add objects, uh, plural here, sorry, um, that accepts an array of objects to add. And then all it needs to do in this in the implementation of add objects is just map over them and pass them to batch. The same for delete object. And that makes it way easier to have a consistency in a client, in your API client, than making this actually consistent in your API. Because for example, maybe in your API, there really is no difference in how each of these batch things are processed. This is really simple to do in your backend and you don't want to change it. You don't want to add like 10 million API um, entries because that would be cluttering. Uh, and this allows you to do this just client side and makes people not even aware that they need a batch behind the scenes to add multiple objects instead of like adding all the objects uh, in separate API calls. So um, the next thing what you always want to do is you want to allow overriding of pretty much anything. And I have a pretty interesting quote for that here uh, by Sunil Pai, he works at Facebook. The quality of an abstraction is directly related to the quality of, of its escape hatches. What that means is that at some point, any abstraction will break down. And if you then need to spend a lot of time actually making the API work again or Figuring out, figuring out, oh, it's using fetch behind the scenes, so I need to add this or that. You, um, ideally, you'll never want to know what the actual implementation is behind an abstraction. So how are we going to apply this to this um, API client? Is by allowing the overriding of any of the injected options, like, for example, the API key at call site. It would look something like this. So since we had the uh, extra argument as its second argument, all we need to do is have the injected keys first, and then afterwards you have the second argument to the function of your API client, and then uh, this will override the first argument, and then you can simply use the API key at call site. What we also have um, in our uh, API in Algolia is we have something called request options. Request options is just a, um, spe uh, a specification that we decided. So there are some known headers. And these all have a, uh, sorry, this has a slide. There are some known headers. And each of them, like for example, user ID, API key, each of them needs to be sent by a very specific header but you can just write them there in a shorthand and then the value. And then we just decided that if it is not one of the headers that we know will be sent as a header, then we will add it as a URL parameter. And maybe your API has something like that, maybe it does not, but it allows lots of expressi expressivity without needing to change any of the first arguments. So imagine you want to have like an A-B test or something, and in your API, 
and you're not really sure if it's a good idea yet. So what you can add is you add something which will apply on the query parameter. It's like, for example, um, use machine learning or not. That's an idea uh, that you maybe as maybe is pertinent to you. So what you need to do is you will add this to the request headers, uh, the request arguments, and it will be put as the query string. And you never need to release a new version of the of the API client, even if it's in your code. You don't even need to touch that piece. Uh, it can be seen as an opaque blob, and it just adds URL parameters, and it will work. The second thing what you want to do, especially if you want to have an API client, which works for both uh, browsers and for Node, is you want to separate your request, the whole request part, from the actual method. So here's an example of uh, an implementation of a method called request, which just takes all of the arguments that you would expect to send uh, just in a flat uh, list, um, or you can organize this, of course, however you want. And then fetch will be called with these arguments. The big ar uh, advantage of this is that you can add uh, build time or whatever time you need, you can change the implementation of request. Uh, there, there's lots of ways how to make this dynamic. You can maybe add it as an argument to every method, and uh, that's what we do actually. You add it as an argument to every method, and then depending on which one, uh, if it's imported on Node or on the browser, it will give us the browser requester or the Node requester. Then this makes the code for the um, actual implementation of search here way more straightforward. All you, need to, you don't need to worry about JSON because they're all JSON. You don't need to worry about um, that it's all on a certain domain. They're all on a certain domain. This also allows you, um, in case you have a very advanced API, to um, do stuff like retry logic, um, depending on how many machines you have. But in most cases, that doesn't really matter for you. The next thing I want to do is just a small, um, a small example. Uh, imagine you're on a website and you download it for the first time and there's one post request being done. So there's a single post request being done. And this is the one that we expect. But you see that there's actually twice underscore search here. Um, so we see here is a simple post request. And if we look at the first one, it has a, an options request. So why does this happen? This is uh, simply because of the, uh, the course spec. Course is a cross-origin request strategy. Uh, and you can avoid this request. In some cases, uh, this, this request is always going to be sequential. Your first request needs to be completed, so a complete round trip to your server and back, before you can do the actual post request. Of course, this only needs to happen <coughs> once per page load, but still, that is an impact, and you might want to avoid it. There is a solution for that, and it's called simple request. So in the specification, of course, um, if you allow only a subset of all of the requests that you do, then the options request will not be sent. Um, there are three main things you need to take in account. First, you can only use get, head, or post as methods. You cannot use delete or any of the other ones, or put. Uh, you can only use a specific subset of the headers, uh, plus the ones that the browser automatically sends, but these don't count because you cannot access them. Uh, notice that a content type is here. It can only be three specific values, though. Uh, and these three specific values are form, form with, uh, with images, or uh, plain text. Notice that application JSON is absent there, which is pretty annoying. So this does have a very big um, downside, is that you're forced to either send it as plain text or send it as form, and then your API needs to be able to handle, handle it. But if you can, and if you do have the, um, the possibility, you will save a request. So let's now um, go over an overview of the things that I said. First, uh, it's interesting to separate the, f the actual requests from within your, your whole app, because that allows you to do optimizations on them. Secondly, you don't want to leak your abstraction. You don't want to leak that you're maybe using fetch 
because you want to change it later or you want to maybe use Axios for some reason. Um, it's very useful if you have API keys or things like that, stuff that repeats, that's always used, to use a client. This client um, will simply augment each of your methods um, with the stuff that you will only need to mention once. If you can use uh, simple requests, know when to deviate from your API. So if you have a batch or something catch all that you want to use for multiple, several things, like completely different ones, it becomes very useful to, um, to separate these in separate, separate, several method calls, but still allow, of course, the, the catch all for in case it changes later. And you can look at other API clients. Most of them are open source and there's, yeah, there's people making them. So you can just look at them. Thank you. On va faire quelques questions. N'hésitez pas à les poser en français si, ouais. si vous préférez. Et si vous avez envie de poser des questions, je vais vous envoyer la boîte. Ouais. Tout au fond, j'ai vu. Ah, on a une question là-bas. Tu cours Non, je pense qu'il ne veut pas. Je cours pas. Où ça, où ça Il y avait monsieur au fond. Non, non, ok. Non, non. Ok. Um, ok, so I was wondering if uh, at Algolia you are using the simple requests form for your uh, Algolia client. Uh, and if so, are you converting your G your JS objects to plain text, or what form of data you are sending? Um, the form that we are supporting is form data. So right. for search uh, only, not for any of the other ones, but only for search because it used front end and uh, it's very resource in intensive. We use form data, and our API accepts form data for this one. Thanks. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, is there a specific reason why you avoid using a class for that? For, for the dependency injection that you showed or, or stuff like that? Uh, because that's too long on a slide. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, bon, alors on passe au suivant. N'hésitez pas après euh, en mangeant les pizzas. 